When Onyata learned about the death of his nephew, the punishments were brutal. 800 men, women, and children perished in a three-day battle. Onyata ordered all warrior age males to have their left foot chopped off. When Spain learned of these atrocities, Onyata was tried and convicted. This resulted in Onyata being banished from northern New Mexico and stripped him of all his titles. The first successful revolutionary war in North America was in 1680, the Pueblo Revolt. For a hundred years, the Spanish settlements forced the Pueblo natives to pay tribute and outlawed religion and spiritual practices. Some were hung, publicly whipped, or imprisoned for violation of these laws. One native named Pope was in prison for practicing his spirituality. After his release, Pope organized the revolt. Pope had native runners travel to all the northern pueblos with three knots in a rope. Each knot represented a day for the countdown to the revolt. The Pueblo Revolt resulted in the death of over 200 Spanish and mixed-blood inhabitants. The rest of the remaining 2,000 settlers were forced to leave New Mexico. The Spanish returned in 1692. This is known as a missionary period. The Spanish missionaries were more tolerant of their religion this time, and that's why you'll find kivas alongside of the mission ruins from this period. By this time in history, there was relative peace in northern New Mexico. The Borroguero culture was dominating the Pueblo and the Spanish settlements. By 1810, Mexico had won its independence from Spain, and the San Miguel de Vado land grant of 350,000 acres in the Pecos Valley was overpopulated. 36 families moved north to settle and establish the Las Vegas land grant of 496,446 acres in 1835. In 1836, Texas had won its independence from Mexico, and by 1841, 300 Texas troops had entered Las Vegas to claim the territory for Texas. They were surrounded, disarmed, arrested, and marched to Old Mexico, where they were later released. By 1845, Texas was annexed and now part of the United States. The U.S. adopted the doctrine of manifest destiny a belief that the white Anglo-Saxons were a special race and rightfully superiors of all other peoples, which gave them a God-given right to expand the nation from the Atlantic to the Pacific. On May 13, 1846, the United States declared war on Mexico. In June of 1846, General Stephen Kearney and his army entered Las Vegas to claim New Mexico as part of the United States. History states that Kearney took New Mexico without firing a shot, that the only resistance was the mud on his wagon wheels. But there was resistance to the occupation. The Spanish, Comanche, and Apache joined forces in Taos, Mora, and Las Vegas. Tomas Ortiz had his fingers shot off during the revolt. He was able to escape capture. This revolt ended with New Mexico's first U.S. governor, Charles Bent, losing his head. The United States Army leveled Taos, Mora, and shelled Las Vegas as a punishment for the resistance. The leaders were arrested, tried, and hung as traitors. The Mexican-American War officially ended on February 2nd, 1848. New Mexico was now a U.S. territory. A short time after that, a half dozen U.S. soldiers arrived in the village of San Agustin, looking for some missing horses. They began to drive off the livestock that belonged to the villagers. The alcalde, his two sons, and four of the neighbors approached the soldiers. One U.S. soldier fired the first shot. When the dust settled, all the soldiers were dead. The U.S. Army arrested all 300 villagers and marched them to Santa Fe. Six men were charged in a military tribunal and hanged at the Palace of the Governors. 
This was a clear case of justifiable homicide that belonged in a district court. They were known as the Seis Vecinos of San Agustin. New Mexico has its own trail of tears. It's called the Long Walk. Kit Carson arrived in the Navajo homeland with a scorched earth policy. He burned all the crops, slaughtered all the livestock, and forced marched the Navajo in the dead of winter to Bosque de Rodondo, Fort Sumner. Over 200 natives perished in this 300 mile walk. Manuelito, the leader of the Navajo, returned his people to their homeland in 1868. As a U.S. territory, not much had changed for the northern Spanish settlements until July 4th, 1879, the arrival of the train. The train brought a certain breed of man to the territory, land speculators, lawyers, and thieves. These men organized a politically corrupt underground organization known as the Santa Fe Ring. They carved up the land grants through fraudulent deals and amassed great wealth and power through the courts, theft, and intimidation. The leader of the Santa Fe Ring was Thomas Catron, a lawyer, the largest landowner, and New Mexico's first senator. A dicho, a saying, of the time period goes, Cuando toma cuerpo el diablo, se disfraza un abogado. Translated, when the devil takes human form, his disguise is a lawyer. Their barbed wire fences cut off the people from their grazing land and their water. But for every action, there is a reaction. The reaction to the Santa Fe Ring and the land theft was fought on multiple fronts. Three brothers led the resistance. The eldest, Juan Jose Herrera, Pablo Herrera, and the youngest, Nicanor Herrera. Pablo organized Las Gorras Blancas, the White Caps, a secret group of night riders that rode under the cover of darkness, cutting down hundreds of miles of fence that cut off the people from the ejido, the common lands. They wore white hoods so their neighbors would never have to testify to their identity. Juan Jose organized the Caballeros de Labor, the Knights of Labor. They fought the railroad for equal pay for Hispanics to their Anglo counterparts. And they did not discriminate. Any Hispano who tried to cash in on the speculation was dealt with. Together, the three brothers organized the first Hispanic-controlled political party, El Partido del Pueblo Unido, the United People's Party. They distributed their platform across San Miguel so they would not be misunderstood. They signed this platform, Las Gorras Blancas, 1,500 members and growing daily. Every one of the United People's Party's candidates won in a landslide election, defeating both Republicans and Democrats. Juan Jose Herrera became a judge, and Pablo was elected to the New Mexico State Legislature. On the last day of the session, Pablo stated on the record, Gentlemen, I have served several years' time in the penitentiary, but only 60 days in the legislature. I have watched the proceedings here carefully. I would like to say that the time I spent in the penitentiary was more enjoyable than the time I have spent here. There is more honesty in the halls of the territorial prison than in the halls of the legislature. I would prefer another term in prison than another election to the House. He then left and returned to Las Vegas, and on Christmas Eve, 1891, he was assassinated by Billy Green, shot in the back and then in the head. All that used to be Spain, then Mexico. From Texas to California, the land grants were lost, except in northern New Mexico. Because of the Gorras Blancas, we still have our community land grants. Almost every citizen of Las Vegas believed that the railroad would come through the plaza. It didn't. It was built to the east, a new town sprung up, and in November of 1879, the Las Vegas Optic newspaper declared, East Las Vegas is an American town and will be governed by Americans only. Another segregated town was born. In 1898, the Spanish-American War broke out. The United States needed horsemen and Spanish-speaking soldiers, and Teddy Roosevelt knew both could be found in Las Vegas. 
this was an opportunity for the native Spanish men to show their patriotism to the United States by taking up arms against their former country. They were known as the Rough Riders. Aldo Leopold arrived in northern New Mexico in 1911. His job with the forestry was to rid the wilderness of predators, therefore leaving more game for hunters. He claimed that when he shot the last wolf in New Mexico, he saw a green fire leave her eyes. He realized at this moment that what he was doing was wrong. He dedicated the rest of his life to the protection and reintroduction of predators in order to keep a healthy, natural balance in the wilderness. We have featured the animals of El Norte throughout the mural. New Mexico and Arizona were the last territories to become a state in 1912. New Mexico endured 67 years of territory status for two reasons. Too many Mexicans and too many Catholics. It took only 16 years after statehood for those fears to be realized when Octaviano Ambrosio Larasolo became the first Hispanic U.S. Senator in 1928. And we cannot leave out the music of northern New Mexico, like accordion player Antonio Apolaca and fiddle player Cleofes Ortiz. New Mexico sent more Hispanics per capita to World War I than any other state, and upon their return, the Spanish flu epidemic hit. West Las Vegas was quarantined off. Nor doctors or nurses were allowed to care for the sick in West Las Vegas, and the sick were not allowed to travel to East Las Vegas. Thousands perished. In World War II, the 120th engineers of Northern New Mexico and Oklahoma were predominantly Hispanic and Native American. They fought from North Africa to Germany over 360 consecutive days of combat without a break, earning nine medals of honor. Also during World War II, the federal government banned all radio stations from broadcasting in any language other than English. And out of over 260 foreign language stations in the United States, only one refused to comply. KFUN in Las Vegas, New Mexico. Ernie Thwaites refused to stop broadcasting in Spanish and suffered the pressure and the consequences of the U.S. government threatening to take his station and his home. The Castle of Montezuma was built as a resort by the railroad. It later became a Mexican Catholic monastery and by this time in history was occupied by hippies of the 1960s. It's now the United World College, USA. U.S. soldiers were ordered to defend Clark Air Base in the Philippines during World War II. The New Mexico soldiers were the first to fire on the Japanese. They had outdated weapons that dated back to World War I. After four months of fighting, without supplies or reinforcements, their commander surrendered. Over 100,000 men were forced to march to the prison camps. Per capita, there were more prisoners, soldiers, from New Mexico than any other state specifically the 200th and the 515th. This event is known as the Patan Death March. Felix Barella was a young man from the west side of Las Vegas. He was a tough kid and even a tougher soldier. In 1966, he was ambushed in Vietnam, wounded twice, and engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He killed eight enemy soldiers, saving the lives of his brothers in arms. Felix received the Distinguished Service Cross, the Purple Heart, Vietnam Service Medal with a Bronze Star, and the Vietnam Campaign Medal. Felix died on the West Side at the age of 38, without ever receiving any benefits from the U.S. government. A number of civil rights movements started in the 1960s and the 1970s. One organization that sprung up was the Brown Berets. They organized in Los Angeles, California to protect Latino neighborhoods from police brutality. They went on a cross-country caravan to educate and recruit members. As they went through Santa Fe, New Mexico, they were all arrested for marching without a parade permit. The West Las Vegas School Board Chairman and District Attorney Donaldo Tiny Martinez had the Brown Berets released to him. 
He allowed them to camp out at West High School. They lowered the U.S. flag and raised the Mexican flag. It made nationwide news and prompted the White House to call the governor of New Mexico, who in turn called Tiny to ask him to lower the flag. But not even the governor tells Tiny what to do. He left it up for three more days. East and West Las Vegas was desegregated during this time period. Politicians from East and West came together because of one woman's cooking, Mama Lucy. The shot callers from both sides of the Gainas sat in the same restaurant where they began to talk to each other. The conversation resulted in Las Vegas becoming one city again. Dolores Huerta, the co-founder of the United Farm Workers Union, was born just north of Vegas at Dawson, New Mexico. As a child, she moved to Las Vegas and lived on Moreno Street. Her father was a secretary treasurer of the Steelworkers Union. She's probably the most prominent Latina in the country and maybe even the world. Reyes Lopez Tigrina, El Tigre, the Tiger, fought diligently in the North trying to recover Spanish and Mexican land grants that were stolen during New Mexico's territorial period. He was asked by Dr. Martin Luther King to lead the Poor People's March on Washington, D.C. He's most famous for what's known as the courthouse raids. He tried to serve a citizen's arrest on the district attorney in Tierra Maria. A shootout with the police ensued. The police and military embarked on the largest manhunt in New Mexico history. Reyes eventually turned himself in. He was charged criminally, fired his lawyer, and represented himself. He was a preacher who easily won over the jury who acquitted him of all charges. New Mexico Highlands University was a predominantly Hispanic university, but the Hispanic students felt that it was a highly racist environment. And one day they stormed the administration building and chained themselves inside. They demanded the resignation of the president as well as an ethnic studies program. And three days later, the president resigned. And Frank Angel became the first Hispanic president of a four-year university in the nation. Also shown are the murals that were painted by Chicano students. And on a weekend, overnight, the regents ordered that they be painted over. The most significant thing about this last panel is that every contemporary image displayed was not resolved at the time the mural was completed. The 1199 formed a union at Alta Vista Hospital. The hospital refused to recognize them. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the court forced Alta Vista to reinstate those who were fired and to enter into negotiations with the 1199. When Invenergy wanted to place industrialized windmills on the Bernal Mesa, the residents of the area asked San Miguel County Commission to provide a two-mile setback in their wind ordinance. The county caved to the pressure from the industry and passed an ordinance with a half-mile setback requirement. The residents then went to newly elected Ray Powell Land Commissioner and asked that they place the setbacks in the leases on public lands. Commissioner Powell agreed and the residents prevailed. The former land commissioner orchestrated a land swap with a private rancher, giving away White's Peak. The masses marched on the Capitol in Santa Fe the first day of the session. The Attorney General and Lulac sued the land office and had the land swap overturned. The PM plant on the west side has been a major polluter. After years of protests and actions, it was finally shut down. The county commission worked for years to develop an oil and gas ordinance so the oil industry can explore for natural gas. The ordinance that the county settled on was very weak. After an election and quite a bit of organizing, that ordinance was tossed in the trash. Now San Miguel County has one of the safest oil and gas ordinances in the country. And water has always been front and center. We have a saying that goes, El agua no se vende, el agua se defende. The water is not for sale, it's to defend. <laughs>